What, what the idea is culturally, we want to excite people so much about tomorrow that today becomes obsolete. I want that you spend all your brain on working out how do I get there as opposed to how do I fix it. Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to another episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with uh, different professionals uh, that have a career in the BPM field or space, whether they're working internally at an organization, whether they're coming in as an as a consultant, whether there are researchers or professors or, or whatever area of the, of the BPM world they come from, I get the privilege of sitting down and understanding and learning more about how they view BPM and where I guess BPM or business process management can bring value to organizations. Um, and today I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with Michael Roseman. Now, a lot of you will have will know that name. And in fact, I have been requested to, when are you interviewing Michael? When are you bringing Michael on the show? And so I'm really excited for, for this episode. If you don't know who Michael Roseman is, um, currently he's the director of the Center for Future Enterprise at QUT, as well as a professor for innovation systems. Um, now he's got he's got an extensive career working in the the field of BPM, and I just want to read a little bit from his profile because I think it sums it up nicely. His works led to, among others, to globally deployed ideation techniques, a widely accepted BPM maturity model, the rapid process redesign method NEST N E S double T, a framework for ambidextrous BPM context-aware process management, configurable process models and guidelines for process model quality. And so hopefully we'll be able to dive into a couple of these topics today. Michael, thank you for joining me. Oh, Daniel, absolute pleasure to be here. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity. That's great. So what we might do to begin with is if you can take the audience on a journey all the way back to when your interest in process first peaked and then take us on a journey leading up to where we are today. Of course, of course. So I, I would say my, my first exposure to process was when I was a student and, and my main areas of interest were, were operations management, yep. literally how factories work, production planning and control, logistics, or what we call then computer integrated manufacturing. And, and as we know, and the typical BPM textbook refers to the Henry Fords of the world, this is the domain of production and operations where, where we gave birth to process thinking. Right. Um, we, we spend a lot of time and energy to reflect on how you design these processes, how you sync up resource requirements, but then quickly realize processes are, are everywhere. And it's interesting how, how today banks, insurance companies talk about service factories, about bill of materials and, and replicate in many, many aspects, also in terminology, what factories have done. Um, then in the 90s, uh, enterprise systems and I'd say a more um, applicable approach to process modeling emerged. Um, I myself, I'm the, the, the grandson of, of Cher who created ARIS and a quite significant uh, software solution facilitating process modeling. So then our interest came up around not just how you manage, but how, to, how you model processes. My whole PhD was around managing and modeling large scale process landscapes. Right. And then like so many, I, I spent maybe 10 years on how do we improve process life cycles? How do we get even better and capturing processes, working what's broken and overcome this sort of pain and I was once in a project and, and someone asked me, Michael, when you see all this pain, how do, you, how do you know what to do about it? And then I realized our BPM knowledge is so mature on pain, on diagnosis, right. types of waste, variation in Six Sigma, human labor in RPA, but our knowledge is extremely shallow when it comes to the design of a new process. Right. So I would say since five or 10 years, my interest shifted from analyzing what is broken to working out what is possible. And, and this is why my interest is probably more around future processes than past processes, more on the design than on the analysis. Yes, yes, that's great. And when, when an organization, I guess, spends so much time, effort and energy on looking at where are the pain points, uh, where are the problems, 
what I guess what are they missing out on by spending too much time focusing there and not enough on well where are we heading in the future? Um, what 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 is the radical innovation that we want to um, implement in this organisation? What are they missing out on there? I, I guess they miss out more and more because our world is becoming opportunity rich. So a typical process analyst probably looks more to the inside. They look at their process model, they look for pain, and in a very reactive manner, try to fix it while the outside world is moving on. Right. We have new technologies, we've got new business models, we've got customers with a high digital literacy. But, but if you only follow what is broken and not the question of what is possible, we might create a highly efficient process that, and this is the biggest danger, might become non-relevant. Right. Most companies that we have seen being disrupted didn't get dis disrupted because they didn't do BPM not well enough. They were highly efficient. They just became non-relevant. Right. And, and this is what we call disruption and, and disruptive innovation doesn't really care about operational efficiency. It cares about the relevance of your process. Yes. And I think the biggest, biggest challenge for our community is that we have spent so much time in maturing our understanding of pain and, and looking on the inside and are not good enough on, on environmental sensing and exploring what is possible. Yes, right. And where, does, where should that innovation come from? Is that something that should be driven from the executive level or is that something that um, it should be a, a cultural thing that um, all employees have this innovation mindset? Um, where should that come from or be driven from? Yeah, so before we talk about where it comes from, we should work out why we need innovation. We need right. innovation for two reasons. We, we first of all have a sense of urgency. And um, if I don't innovate in, in times of COVID, if I don't innovate as an airline, and um, if I don't innovate because I, I produce a combustion engine in, 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 in the car industry, uh, I have a massive problem. But it also might be innovation because of a sense of ambition. Uber, Apple, Amazon don't continuously innovate because they have to, but because they want to. Right, right. Now, what we do, we work with organizations and try to work out, is this largely a sense of urgency or is this a largely a sense of ambition? Right. Uh, a sense of ambition occurs when you have got compelling leaders. Leaders who have a strong narrative and say, in five years, I want to be there. I don't want to be a car insurance company. I look after the well-being of a car owner. I go from products to platforms. That's a sense of ambition. Um, if you don't have that leader, well, then you probably continue to do BPM and implement RPA in your claim handling process, which is a good option, and you automate claim handling, um, but you remain, of course, a, a car insurer that uses current best practices. Right, right, right. If cars don't require car insurance anymore for all kind of reasons, well, then you look at your highly automated claims engine that nobody needs. Yes. And this is why, why we coined this term ambidextrous BPM, where we say exploit and explore, fix pain and ask yourself what is possible. And, and, and this is needed in a, an opportunity rich environment. But our lessons learned working with many companies is sometimes that, that those who are very good on exploitation are, are, are sometimes not, not good enough on exploration. Right, right. Now, on that question, you said exploit and explore what is possible when it comes to, I guess, innovation, when it, when it comes to business process management, what is possible? Do you have an example on that comes to mind where an organization um, implemented some form of innovation and, and it delivered significant value um, to an organization? We obviously see innovation happening um, in startups. We're seeing some startups coming along and and disrupting entire industries. But do you have any examples of um, established organizations, large organizations that they have implemented some, some form of in innovation and, and it has um, played out for them? Yeah, so the first question is, how do we come up with these ideas? And it's interesting, when, when we teach BPM, we're very mechanical. We teach you seven types of ways, we call it lean management, and, and everyone would come up with the same diagnosis. But if we talk about what's an innovation, we say, well, think outside the box, do some brainstorming, work some colored uh, post-it notes and, and hope some, someone has a great idea. Now, we try to make innovation as mechanical as lead management. I give you one example. What I call process generalization means you look at your process and you try to work out what else could I do with the capability. 
Example, I'm, I'm Amazon, I'm, I'm good in buying, storing and selling books. And that's all that Amazon could have done. What they've done said, well, we take this process, but instead of books, we're using toys. Right. Or instead of toys, we put tomatoes through the same process. Uber probably could have been rich enough by just moving people from A to B. Right. But once they understood, we allow people to, to kind of consume crowdsource mobility as a service. They said, whether it's a person or a pizza, it doesn't make a difference. And we create Uber Eats. Um, they talk to Qantas and create uh, uh, passenger services. In America, they look after patients. And now in Australia, you can order potatoes, pet food, or parcels. What Uber has done, they took one process and asked themselves, what else can I do with this capability? Right. Most companies first create a product and then a process. Amazon and uh, Uber are good examples where, where they did exactly the opposite, create a process and then find products. And that's a sort of shift of mindset we would love to see um, in organizations that we say, would it be possible to use our capability for a different purpose? Could I be an airline that is very good on dynamic pricing and sell the process of dynamic pricing to other organizations, right. cinemas, Australia Post, retailers? And this is where you create new revenue models and not just operational efficiency. Yes, yes, that's great. And, and for someone listening right now that maybe they're uh, at a lower level of the organization and they're, they're hearing you talk about um, innovation and maybe that is, um, it's, it's, it's sparking questions inside of them that look, this is something that our organization needs to put more, give more attention to because um, traditionally we've been focusing on the pain points and the problems and the challenges. Um, what are the next steps or what are the first steps that that person should take um, in trying to encourage or encourage innovation in their organization? Yeah, so, so change for people and companies occurs in three stages, awareness, acceptance, and action. Mm -hmm. So what we say is, first of all, you have to build awareness. And while most companies are very much aware of their problems, bottlenecks, queues, delays, underutilized resources, they're probably not aware of their opportunities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so what I would encourage, no matter where you're in the organization, ask yourself, what else could I do with this business process? I'll give an example, Qantas. When you book a flight with Qantas, Qantas now asks you, do you have a dog or cat at home and can we provide pet sitting services? Right. I got an event earlier than anybody else that says, Daniel won't be home for five days. I could have sold you an airline ticket, but I sell complementary services. So that's a second pattern um, where you do event brokerage. Now, if you process analysts, ask yourself, do I have events like this? Could I create complementary revenue models? It is highly likely that many in your organizations won't think like this. Yes. So you have to build up awareness of what is possible and acceptance would then mean that might be a compelling for, idea for us. And rather than just cutting costs, we might, might address some issues by creating new revenue models. So, so being aware as a builder by, by uh, identifying and, and communicating those sort of opportunities and then hope that they lead to acceptance, meaning that, that some leaders actually get excited or at least appreciate uh, not just operational efficiency, but that processes could also be a source of enter new custom experiences and revenue models. Yes, right. And when talking to that executive team, uh, you know, to try and get that acceptance from them, how do you communicate to them? What do they need to hear? What do they want to hear? How, how do you speak their language um, so that, um, that it does get them excited and they do want to accept it? Could, because obviously they've got a lot of things yeah. vying for their attention. They, they are feeling the pains. They're feeling the problems. They're, 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 the challenges are being highlighted to them. Um, how do you pull their attention and, and focus that on the innovation, get that awareness from them. Yeah. So we, we, we try to understand are these leaders who react to urgency or to ambition? Right. Um, if these are leaders that react to urgency, that they probably are used to analytics, business cases, a clear narrative. Now the challenge is if you do innovation, that, that sometimes you're the very first who's doing this. Uh, if I at QT would say, we, we, we upgrade our degrees from now on. We, we sell an MBA like a piece of software. We give an MBA 2.1 and the new process will mean we, we, we upgrade you, we talk to you, 
and we create a complete new revenue model with our alumni base. Well, that doesn't exist in the world. So it's very hard for me to craft a business case because right. I have to make a lot of assumptions. So uh, the, the process analyst who says, I do X, Y, and Z, and when I'm finished, you have the following return on investment is, is a, a very solid Excel spreadsheet. The process innovator doesn't have the same uh, safety in numbers. Uh, but nevertheless, if you're driven by urgency, I, I either try to come as close as possible to a business case, or I truly have leaders who want to have uh, an innovative legacy. Leaders wow. who are driven by creating something new, who look more to the right, to so the revenue model, than to the left, the cost model of their business model. Yes. And if you have leaders like this, and I think this is what we see a lot in Silicon Valley. As I said, Jeff Bezos is probably more obsessed with growth than with operational excellence. Yes, right. And if, if leaders in the boardroom and if your directors think like this, well, well then they appreciate uh, process innovation and, and maybe subscribe more to the proposed business model than the business case. Yes, right, right. And now there was a point on your profile where it talks about, you know, being having context aware process management. Can you talk about what does what is context aware process management and why is that important for people to understand? So the, the example uh, that we came up with the idea was an insurance company. And here in Brisbane, subtropical storms uh, mean that when a storm hits Brisbane, that uh, the call volume goes up by the factor of three or four. People lodge more claims. Now, what happens is all of a sudden your process has to scale up. So you've got a call center and in the past, this was a very manual process. Context aware systems say my process or the requirements for this process depend on an external variable, let's say weather. If I study weather forecasts, I can literally predict that in 24, 48 hours, call volume goes up. This insurance company now uh, changes this process to, to rapid lodgements. We ask less questions and they onboard more call center agents. So they, they, they scale up resourcing. So that's a simple example where a factor like weather determines the process configuration. Now, typical process modeling languages, BPMN as an example, don't talk about context. There's no element called weather, external interest rate, accident or COVID regulation. Right. Um, now, uh, a context aware process designer would try to work out what are the external variables that impact my internal processes? Mm. Um, and, and we call this process latency. How much time do I need? So my process is adapted to new circumstances. Mm -hmm. Context aware BPM means, well, I could literally automate the reconfiguration of the call center. Right. I could subscribe to weather service and could hard code that in 48 hours I launch a new process without any human being involved. Right, right. If the national interest rate goes down, I might change procurement process because purchasing larger lot sizes becomes economically attractive. Again, my SAP system, my Oracle system, my enterprise system doesn't work like this. So what we try to work out is can we add external elements of relevance um, to your processes so that uh, internal and external variables are tightly coupled. Yes, right, right. And what are you noticing at the moment um, that organizations are, like the mistakes that organizations are making when it comes to process management? Obviously, that there's a, a range of BPM maturity levels out there. And we, we, there are some organizations here in Australia that, um, it's, it's very much um, influence from the top down. Um, and then there are other organizations where process management, it started on a project level, it mm. grew to the business unit, to the department, then the organization took notice and then decided, yep, let's do this. Let's do business process management across the organization. But what generally, what is, what is maybe one of the biggest mistakes organizations are making when it comes to managing and un managing and improving their processes? That's a great question, Daniel. And we, we studied this carefully. Um, I, I would say it's 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 the lack of of, of true impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think our our technical BPM skills, modeling a process, analyzing a process, implementing, creating a workflow, RPA, even process mining, are, are capabilities that have tremendously matured. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we see a tremendous amount of mistakes in that space. The challenge is that I think a lot of 
BPM committee members are too easily satisf satisfied with the output. Right. The Antipas architecture, the running workflow, uh, and not with impact. Um, mm. You might redesign a process, and instead of 12 days, it takes five days. So what? We have a faster process. Did it create a competitive advantage? Right. Did it right. Uh, 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 allow us to market differently? Did it change our brand perception? Uh, did it increase market share? So we, we in our established body of knowledge end up with a redesigned process, but we don't capture the impact it had. And I would wish that, that methodologies around BPM don't just stop at here's a 2B model, but really talk about that's just the output of an initiative. What's the outcome? Yes. And what's the ultimate impact for us, our citizens, our customers, whatever stakeholder I'm interested in? And I would say to be a bit more obsessed with impact is what I would love to see. Yes. Uh, and it's very challenging when you believe in BPM, but your senior stakeholders don't. And they only change, as I highlighted, if they're willing to accept. It's highly unlikely that they get excited about your enterprise architecture. Yes. It's highly yeah. unlikely that they get excited about the fact that the workflow is up and running. They might not even get excited about the fact that our process is two days faster. Mm -hmm. They want to work out, so what? And if the process button doesn't deliver, well, then I press the customer button, the employee button, the, the technology button, the, the, the whatever button I want. But I've got multiple buttons that I can press. The process button is just one of many. Yes, right, right. And so it's about um, understanding or aligning processes with the overall strategy, would you say? That's one. I mean, maybe talk about innovation. Often process innovation inspires strategy design. Right. Those who craft a strategy often don't know what's possible. Example, we, we work for a water company and, and we ask them, do you just want to be a, a hygiene factor, provide water, take care of uh, uh, the, the wastewater and, and do direct debits? And then we come up with the idea of, 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 of sensing, yeah? Smart toilet, you literally can sense the well-being of an individual. And all of a sudden you go from the water business into the healthcare business. Nobody who designed a strategy for this company ever thought about we are the healthcare business. Right. But carefully listening to possible process innovation might inspire strategy. So I think the second mistake is that we say process follows strategy. If you have a high sense of ambition, if you care about innovation more than improvement, you could inspire, you could inspire strategy. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then you, then, then I think you, you definitely get excitement. Yes. Yeah. That's great. And you mentioned earlier, uh, just briefly about COVID and maybe I'd, I'd like to dive into that. Yes. Um, looking at the, the year that we have been through, um, it's certainly disrupted a lot of organizations. It's, it's played out in, in, in favor of some organizations. Some organizations, organizations have thrived during the last year. And then there are a whole lot of organizations that have really struggled, but um how has this year um, with COVID um, impacted, I guess, the way organizations manage their processes? What, what has it exposed um, yeah. and how are organizations adapting? So we, we studied this and I, I call this extreme design. So all of a sudden, we, if you go to retailers, we, we, we hired five, 10, Walmart, 150,000 employees. So all of a sudden, your recruitment process has to have a scale, a speed that was unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, you have got telecommunication companies who now within two hours do what they've done in three weeks. So extreme scalability. Uh, universities, our very own university within a week made 1180 lectures available on Zoom. Right. So this is extreme conversion. Um, but then also we saw the emergence of something completely new and that's called hibernation. So all of a sudden your, your processes hibernate. Process hibernation is the term that doesn't exist. Right. So if you're a process analyst, a process professional, you, you're not used to process hibernation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of BPM professionals were looking for, well, well how do I hibernate a process? Right. How do I hibernate a process intelligently? So the sort of extreme scale, extreme conversion, extreme hibernation um, is a complete new skill set, tool set, mindset that emerged over the last eight or nine months. Mm. That is hopefully here to stay, um, but it's quite amazing that we still try to understand why is it that, that all the process improvement methods we had took a long time and often led to incremental change. 
-hmm. when a strong sense of urgency leads to extreme design and extreme outcome. Mm. If you're a process professional, you want to rescue that sort of extreme design capability. I think our academic and professional body of knowledge still has to catch up. And I wouldn't be surprised if 21 sees the term process hibernation uh, becoming a more widely used term. And we professionalize the art of hibernation, something that's crucial right now, maybe not in Australia, but in most countries in the world right now. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's great. And um, talk to us about another point that I, um, I've taken note is rapid process redesign method um, Nest, uh, I believe that's something that you, you've yeah. come up with or created. Talk us through what, what is that? And is that important for process practitioners or, or BPM professionals, I should say, to understand um, and to use in their organizations? So Nest as a methodology emerged from, from QET's, my own university, very own process redesign approach. Right. So there was no appetite to spend endless time on redesigning processes. Second one, there was a high barrier to do the 10th or 11th redesign of an existing corporate card or travel process. Yes. So what we did is we took this idea of ambidextrous BPM, exploitation and exploration. And, and the next innovation was we took it into a spatial room. BPM is often not spatial. You can't see BPM. So what we did is we, we picked a room, emptied the room. And on one wall, we wrote down the future. And we said 20 days, 20 months, 2022. On the other side of the wall, we wrote down today. And then with a tape in the middle of the room, we drew a line. Meaning if I dragged you to the today room, you look at today's process, you look at pain, what's broken, you could winch, you took all the things that, that don't work. Let's say the approvals you need for travel. Right. If I took you to the other half of the room, you didn't use any of these terms. The only question right. we ask you, Danielle, how do you think travel will look like in two years? Right. This is the half where we spent the first three days. Textbook BPM says, study today, model today, diagnose, find the problem and fix it. We did exactly the opposite. Right. And I would always do exactly the opposite. We tried to work out how could tomorrow look like? If we travel 100 years together every year, what can I do with 100 years of traveling? That was the question. Not how do I get rid of an approval step. Yes, yeah. What, what the idea is culturally, we want to excite people so much about tomorrow that today becomes obsolete. Mm -hmm. I want that you spend all your brain on working out how do I get there as opposed to how do I fix this? The big thinkers in the world say, I want to go to Mars. I want to have an e-vehicle. I want to have a driverless car. I want to put you in a capsule from San Francisco to LA. How do I get there? They don't say there's a train going from LA to San Francisco. Let's draw a process model and see what's broken. Right, right. So that thinking was, is, is core of the nest. And, and within four weeks, uh, and the idea was one process per month. Uh, we, we, we redesigned process after process. Yes, right, right. And, but again, in summary, it's, it's very, very visual. So you see future, you see today. On the other side, you see um, uh, regulations and resources. So it's a very spatial, agile-like environment where you can walk through the room and you experience the process change. Um, but it was important for us that people really, really get excited about that change. Yes. But nobody got excited when they looked at the process model, try to find a bottleneck and try to eliminate it. Yes. So the typical BPM way of working and thinking often doesn't unlock excitement. Right. But if I tell you, why don't we create an upgradable degree? It doesn't exist in the world. But if we achieve this, you create a worldwide legacy. Right, right. That right. unlocks extra energy. So to be designed is more exciting than as is. It's just we often don't have the capabilities. We don't have the tools. So this is why we go back to as is design, because we very much know what's going on. You see a problem, but you don't see an opportunity. Right, right. Okay. And then organizations get stuck in the incremental improvement of a process instead of um, how do we um, think of an entirely new way that we can generate revenue. Correct. And you see this when, when people from, from the big successful companies present, they don't talk about the last 10 years. Jeff Bezos doesn't show up and say, are oh, you remember 20 years ago how we looked like? 
we will jump straight to five or 10 years from here. Yes. You see typical incumbents and they talk about banking, travel, university 20 years ago, 10 years ago, look how far we came. Um, and so you can see in the way people present and the way they talk, if they, which side of the room they prefer. Yes. Okay. Um, our focus is now exclusively the second half of the room. We had projects where we don't even enter the today space anymore. I yes. call this now the old room, the opportunity room, where yes. from day one, the only question we try to work out is what's possible. Yes, right, right. And I think that would help getting that buy-in from the process practitioners or the frontline employees. If, if you are showing them, I guess, um, painting that picture, that vision, that direction, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing, this is, this is what you'll be doing, this is how you're going to participate, um, it does, I guess, um, give a different feeling or then if you're just looking at what they're currently doing, being like, oh, we can, we can improve that. We can make that better. Cause you know, sometimes that um, instills a bit of fear into people like, well, why are you looking at my process? Um, mm. I've done this the same way for the last five, 10, 15 Correct, yeah. years. Am I, am I going to lose my job? Are you going to automate this process and then I'll be out of work um, is a totally different feeling than um, looking towards the future being like, well, what new and exciting am I going to be involved in? And it's a very good point, Daniel. And, and maybe that's also my personal motivation because I remember, and it's very personal. I, I spoke to my dad about what I'm doing. And he said, well, so you go to companies, you describe their processes, you automate, streamline. It's a very reductionist approach. If you go out and say, let's explore what else is possible. You add, you, you construct a process, you create new jobs, new careers. You contribute to the well-being of, of, of families. That's personally much more rewarding than saying, I help you with a 10% cost cutting exercise. Yes. And, and so this is also, I think, where, where new generation of talent says, well, I probably don't want to be the one who contributes to operational excellence. I want to create, not reduce. I want to design and not analyze. I get excited about tomorrow and not about unpacking. I love storytelling and not reports. And I prefer business models over business cases. Right. And I, I see the sort of generation emerging right now and, and they don't always feel comfortable. They don't feel at home with the established body of BPM knowledge. Right, right. And now talking about innovation and, and I guess looking towards the future, what, I guess, what are some of the biggest trends that you're noticing? How can, um, I, I'm not sure if, if some of these trends are sort of, uh, span across multiple industries, but what, what sort of things are you noticing that organizations should really be considering um, for their organization? As you mentioned earlier, Amazon started off um, uh, uh, sending books out to people. And now you look at Amazon and they do far more than that. You know, they've got their own music, they've got their own um, TV series and movies and things like that. Like they're, 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 they're doing a lot of things. So what, what trends are you seeing and how can organizations think more innovatively as we move forward? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, what you described is what we call process as platforms. Uh, so what Uber, Amazon have done, they, they look at their capability, but the process is a platform for, for growth. Um, a, a couple of examples. So, so one thing we witness is how we, in addition to transactional processes, purchasing, selling, manufacturing, look into transformational processes. So the typical focus of a, of a process analyst is that you look at high frequency processes. This is where you do Six Sigma or RPA. If companies now said, I like to reduce the cost of innovation. I like to accelerate innovation. I want to be more productive innovation. I like to do digital transformation. Uh, I want to become COVID compliant. Um, so these are all processes, but they're typically very poorly supported. Right. So one area that we have is called innovation systems. And the question is, if innovation as usual will become the new normal, we probably have to be much more productive, efficient. So I guess that a lot of BPM in the future will target also transformational, important, but less frequent processes. The second one, and you alluded to it, um, entrepreneurial processes. So if entrepreneurs grow, explore, prototype, scale, revise, but they do this quickly, textbook BPM won't help them. A minimum viable process is something we typically are not used to. Right. We like to optimize the process, 
but we don't really test the process. We don't have a process hypothesis. We don't do rapid prototyping. So um, uh, EPM, entrepreneurial process management, I, I think is something that we'll see emerging um, because sheer frequency tells us that, that future jobs probably come more from the entrepreneurial ecosystem than the established incumbents. Um, and if process matter to them, though, then we have to work out how do I scale up, revise, prototype a process. Um, and the third one is what I call um, resilient processes. Um, so it's a bit related to the idea of context awareness, but, but how do I design a process that withstands external impact? And, and resilient process could be either robust, meaning uh, let's say I'm a manufacturer, I've got an inventory, and whatever happens outside doesn't matter because I can keep on working. Mm. They could be responsive, what I talked about earlier, if the weather changes, well, then we use process alternative B instead of the running A. Or the agile means I have a process that I can change quickly. I'm thinking on my feet. Mm. So resilient process design, robust, responsive, agile, is probably something we start to appreciate uh, over the last 12 months. But again, the, the typical textbook BPM handbook doesn't use the word resilient design. Yes, yes. So yes. transformational, entrepreneurial, resilient processes are maybe just three examples uh, why I guess we will see more appetite. Yes, yes. And I think that, you know, there, there are many cases or examples throughout this last year where um, organizations have, have had to adapt very quickly. And, you know, I've, I've heard examples of organizations that one day they were, they had hundreds of people in a call center and the next day they were all you know working from their home offices but because they had their processes un understood and managed well that transition transition happened very quickly on the other hand you've got organizations that are um you know they've never even considered this possibility or th that this that they would have to face this um and so they're running around trying to put out fires trying to make this transact transition happen um while you know everything's looking a little um everything is kind of been thrown into chaos um but talking about uh minimal minimum minimum viable process i think that's a really interesting um point to touch on because that's very much how entrepreneurs think is what, what's my minimum minimum viable product and how can yes. i get a product to market really quickly because you know there's no point um perfecting something if you don't know how the market's going to respond you need you need to come up with something that's minim minimum or minimal bring it to the market and then they they're going to give you the feedback that you need to um innovate or improve or, or adapt that idea moving forward. Talk to us about um, minimal, minimum vi viable process and yeah. how organizations should be using that today. So first of all, good observation that MVP typically represents products and not processes. Um, so uh, if you do minimum viable processes, it would mean you, you, you apologize in advance. It, it's like a, like a straw man. I, I throw a first dummy a prototype at you but I know it's not perfect. And, and again, I think um, the language we used in the past, process optimization, uh, led us to the exact opposite. We were looking for the sort of the holy grail, the, 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 the perfect process, which is the absolute opposite to how an entrepreneur works because they're hungry for learning experiences. Mm. Now, an entrepreneur has ongoing, continuous learning experiences, while a process professional thinks in stages. I analyze, I listen, I design and I'm finished and then I move on. So this idea of continuous learning, continuous redesign is very foreign to most process analysts. Mm. And I give you an example. We, we have a retailer and we work on this idea of, let's say customers bringing their own data, say I'm allergic to nuts. Um, and that means if I go shopping at Coles or Woolies or I never buy products anymore that includes these nuts. Now, I don't really know, doesn't mean a warning comes up, doesn't mean I prevent you. So there are a lot of uncertainties. Do you treat this as an intrusion of your privacy and so on? But we like the overall idea. Now, now what we do under the minimum viable process design is you, you craft a process and in a, in a carefully selected environment, test this process, revise this process. This is not a new product, it's a new process. And it's only when we have minimum viable processes that entrepreneurs um, have a high appetite to also uh, invest their creative energy into processes and not just products. 
Mm. So I think minimum viable products is just a sort of catching up on what we know from the field of minimum viable products. And this is why I tend to encourage BPM professionals to make sure that they, they go beyond their discipline. And yes. let's say, what can you learn from, from innovation, from entrepreneurs, from business modeling? And, and how do you add this to your BPM toolkit? Yes, yes, yeah. And how important is, is it um, to, you know, for there to be that culture of innovation inside of an organization? You know, we might, we, there, there, there are plenty of entrepreneurs out there, ones that are, are thinking quite innovatively. Mm -hmm. um, where are the opportunities lying? How can we generate more revenue? But um, maybe sometimes coming up against roadblocks because yeah. the, the culture isn't quite there. How, what, what should that person do or how did that, should that person approach that when um, you know, they're thinking innovatively, but maybe the culture of the organization isn't? Um, yeah, well, that's a very good question that reminds me to a conversation I had with Roger Trigier years ago when he created Process Phil. And the question is, what could Process Phil do? Um, a, a bit like what a what I try to articulate early on, try to make it tangible, yeah? So you, you craft a very tangible story and say, maybe I'm the only one who can see the innovation. I'm the mm -hmm. only one at Woolies who can talk about allergies, smart toilets, upgradable degrees, whatever we covered in the last half an hour. And others don't think like this. Now, mm -hmm. one hope is I just socialize this idea and someone might say, hey, I really like this idea. Mm -hmm. Um, if, of course, you're in an environment where people prefer stability, are risk averse, only move if they can see it's, it's really working somewhere else. Um, then of course, it, it's a very difficult environment. Um, and if innovation means you're a first mover, but nobody wants to be the first mover around you, um, then you're probably very much deadlocked in that environment. Yes. And this is why I think we, we often have a, an evacuation of, of creative thinkers who then leave large organizations to work for entrepreneurs where their creative energy is appreciated. Right, right. Uh, and it, this I think explains also why why job growth comes from smaller companies and not from large companies because right. they tend to become obsessed with freezing the existing business models and focusing on streamlining it, while the growth appetite, the interest in in innovation, is often more visible in in, in young uh, organizations that are much smaller in scale. Yes, yes, right, and and I guess depending on who you're talking to inside that organization whether that they are motivated motivated because of urgency or whether they're motivated mm. because of ambition i guess you could you could um, talk about the same ideas but using different languages um, and um, i could probably even relate to that in my personal life when i'm talking to different people um, if, if i'm talking to my mum for example i'm probably going to talk more at from a, using language that um talks about a sense of urgency um, yeah. because that's probably where she spends more of her headspace. But if I'm talking to someone else that is quite ambitious, I, I'd need to adapt my language to talk to that person the way that they're going to receive that. That's a very good point. I mean, sometimes you talk about processes and ask yourself, are they a patient or an athlete? A patient is sick. So you try to work out what's sick, what's broken. You come up with a perfect diagnosis and therapy. A process that is an athlete says, I want to win a gold medal. I'm not sure in which discipline. I don't know how far I could go. Um, but, but teach me what, what disciplines are available. Where do I have the biggest potential? Um, and so you have to ask yourself, is my bias towards the process as a patient? Surely there must be something broken. Or is this process an athlete in the making? And what else could I do? How do I nurture this talent? Um, but I amplify uh, strengths of the process. Um, and again, I think we have to sort of bias towards, towards the, the thinking about the patient more than the, the thinking about uh, the process being the, the, the new effort. Mm. That's great. Now, for someone that's listening right now, and they've been enjoying this conversation and gleaning a lot um, from what we've been talking about, um, where, what are the next steps they should take when they want to learn more about business process management um, and maybe not necessarily on the, the pain and the problem and the challenges perspective, but on the in innovation side of things, where can that person go to, I guess, um, feed that appetite um, for process um, ambition or in innovation? Because, you know, the, the internet is quite a, there's a lot out there and sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. Well, 
what, where should I be? What, what should I be focusing on? Which resources should I be reading or listening to? Um, so where yeah. should that person uh, direct their attention? So, so first of all, I, I think you won't find a lot of answers in the, in the one-on-one BPM knowledge or, or literature base. Um, so I, I would encourage you to really go to maybe to the innovation community mm-hmm. where we understand what does it mean to prototype, to test, to have a hypothesis. Uh, what is the skill set of a great designer to look at entrepreneurs? So this idea of, of uh, being willing to test, to fail. Um, so I think uh, innovation and entrepreneurial literature might help you. Uh, of course, being biased, I mean, I'm happy to, to also refer to our very own work. So a couple of examples, we, we created a, a template for a, a, an opportunity appetite statement. So every company has a risk appetite statement. I don't know a single company in the world it has an opportunity appetite state besides right. NASA. So that's a starting point where you work out with your leaders, well, what's the appetite for a new business model? What's the appetite right. to create a new type of value? Um, and if my leader says, I want to sell a car insurance for the rest of my life, well then don't come up with a platform model. Yes. Um, and so with the opportunity appetite statement, which is a tangible template, um, we try to suss out what is the authentic appetite here? Right. Uh, we've done some work around really tangible patterns that allow you, can I generalize the process? Can the process start earlier? Can I add a process variation? So, so we've got a few methods where we try to trigger to see what's possible. I tend to say, I don't want that you think outside the box. I want that you have a bigger box. Right. And in our work, we try to make your box so big that you become a, a very mechanical thinker. You don't need post-it notes. You don't need table tennis or music or, or, or beanbags. You just ask yourself, could I generalize? Right. Could I extend? Could I have a variation? Um, could I sell a process capability as a service to someone else? Could I capitalize on an idle asset? So we give you a bunch of prompting questions where, where literally anyone would come up with new ideas. Right, right. So because I think we have to demystify innovation, this is not the the fairyland of creative minds. Um, Innovation can be very tactile, very reliable, very mechanical. Mm. Uh, And I think once this become a widespread uh, um, trade, uh, the cost to innovate, the willingness to innovate, the time to innovate will dramatically drop. And then the cost, uh, sorry, the process of innovation um, is dramatically improved. Yes. That's amazing. Well, Michael, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Obviously, within 40, 45 minutes, we can only scrape the surface of a number of different topics. Um, But I'm sure that the people that have been listening today or will be listening, um, they're going to glean a lot from this conversation. And even if even if they take away one thing that they can they can go and, and it sparks conversation, it starts that conversation. And I guess as you're as you mentioned earlier, that awareness, that's that's really step one is how can you create that awareness amongst your peers and um, your colleagues and, and the people that you are working with. So um, I think that this interview today will do that. Um, so I'm really excited to hear the feedback, but I just want to thank you for um, sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us today. And, and Daniel, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. You do great work. I like what you do. So keep on doing your great work. Uh, there are a lot of process professionals who will benefit. So uh, from all of, uh, of us, the BPM community, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your fantastic work. Thank you.